Here are the top freaking habits we as women need to stop doing. Let's get into it. Stop saying yes to everyone. Guys, we all have a freaking habit. We want to be liked. We really, really do. And so when someone comes to you and asks you either for a favor or for you to go somewhere, God forbid we say no. And God forbid they then don't like us because we've said no. So what ends up happening is that three letter word just keeps coming out of our mouths. We keep saying yes to things that we actually don't want to do. We keep saying yes to things that actually we really, really don't want to do. We keep saying yes to things that actually don't serve us. We keep saying yes to things that we actually dread. So how on earth do we start practicing the beautiful two letter word no? Sometimes that two letter word is so freaking difficult for us to say. So what we do is we inadvertently just head to yes without even meaning to. So step number one in this process, guys, is to just make sure you don't say yes. Like literally that is where I had to start with because I couldn't even bring myself to saying no. So my first step in order to stop saying yes was to actually give myself a quick caveat on being able to take time to think about it. So what I want you to do right now, guys, is write a phrase that that feels really good to you, that gives you time to process what your answer should be. So whether it's someone coming up to you saying, hey, do you wanna to come to this thing that you really don't wanna to go to? Or do you mind doing this thing that you really don't wanna do? What is that safe response that makes you feel good about yourself that you can say in those moments that gives you some distance between when you used to say yes and where you are now and wanting to say no? What is that phrase? So for instance, here are a couple that you can use. I'm not sure, let me get back to you. All right, super sweet, super short, gives you the caveat to basically get back to them so that you don't have to, in real time, feel petrified about saying the word no. You can even add and throw in some words like, you know what, I would love to, but let me get back to you. Or that sounds fantastic, but let me get back to you. Those types of little caveats that you can actually put before the other sentence, then at least for me, someone who felt like a complete chicken that couldn't just jump from a straight yes to going into a no, I needed those little things to be able to say. But write down what are the ones that fit well and seem right for you just to give you that space. Okay, now that you've been given that space, then you can actually process if you should be saying yes to this thing. Now look, I'm not actually saying you should always just say no to something if it doesn't feel right. Sometimes you're gonna sacrifice. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. The right thing as in what I believe is the right thing. So let's say for instance, um, can I take someone to a doctor's appointment? I don't actually wanna to go to the doctor's appointment, but sometimes I would rather say yes to a family member because they feel supported than say no and actually save myself the time. So it's important to sit back in this moment and actually assess. I'm not saying say blindly no to everything. I'm just saying don't say yes because out of fear of saying no. So now you've taken this scenario You've given yourself the space to process whether you should be saying yes to it or whether you should be saying no to it. And when I say the word should, guys, I really mean is what feels right to you. How do you process what your answer needs to be? Now, one thing that I may, I'm going to drop in, just a little drop here right now, is that I would consider if you're saying yes, is it out of obligation? If you're saying yes, is it because you're worried you won't be liked? All of these little things are gonna be really freaking important. So I'm gonna give you a perfect example. I kept getting hit up so much about doing things on Saturdays or doing things on Sundays where there'd be exciting events, there'd be birthday parties, there'd be these big grand events where my friends are speaking, there'd be these travel opportunities and so many things were just coming my way. And I really wanted to say yes to everything. Why? Because I want to be there. I want to show up for people. But in these moments of me always saying yes, it started to become extremely detrimental to my, to my self-care. My gut, my health really started to deteriorate because I was giving up all of my self-care time to saying yes to other people. So what I started to do is I started to distance myself between the time that someone would ask me and saying yes, 
So I realized I was really giving up so much of my self-care. So I created this strategy where I put a space in between someone asking me something and me responding so that I could step back and take that situation and ask myself, is this one of these moments where I need to put myself first? Because if I don't put myself first, can I actually show up for this person? And in those, in that time, in that space, it really allowed me to just look at the situation with no emotion, with no pressure of having to say yes to other people. And then saying, right now, what is more important? Taking care of myself or being there for them? And then I can just do that with clarity. And if it was taking care of myself, guys, even in my response back to them, I would do it with grace. I would say to them, thank you so much for the invite, but it actually turns out that I'm taking this time for myself because I'm really tired. Or you know what, I'm really worn out this week and actually I'm going to take this time to really show up for myself, but I hope you have a blast. Let me know what it's like and send me some photos. That is how you don't just instinctually say yes to things and then regret them after. That is how you don't instinctually say yes to things because you just want to be liked. That is how you actually take a question, assess it and see what is right for you. People pleasing. That's right. How many of us live our lives every day looking to people please? We want to feel good about ourselves. And so what do we do? We actually seek external validation. And it's the external validation where people are happy with you that make us stay exactly where we are. In fact, I'm going to give you a real world example. I was a traditional housewife. I cooked and I cleaned for my husband on the daily. And so I actually had the identity of being a good Greek wife. Now my dad gave me accolades for it. My mom gave me accolades for it. My husband gave me accolades for being a good Greek wife. And so now any idea, any thought of changing my life in not being that good Greek wife and wanting to try something different, I was paralyzed. I was paralyzed because I was so attached. My validation came from people pleasing. My validation came from making other people happy. Their happiness gave me the pat on the back. And so here I was so worried about letting that go that I actually didn't make any change in my life. So guys, when it comes to people pleasing, it is imperative that we just acknowledge how detrimental it can actually be to the life that we want, to the dream that we want to create, to the person we want to become. It is so detrimental that we must, must, must stop people pleasing. All right, so let me give you a real world example of how I navigated getting out of having the identity of people pleasing. I was a very good traditional Greek wife. Like I said, I would cook, I would clean for my husband. To the point, guys, he would wake up in the morning and his work clothes were next to him. He would put them on, he would go to the gym, he would come back, his clean clothes were waiting by the shower. He would go to work, I would hand him a lunch bag. He would come back, his dinner was waiting for him. I was so attached to pleasing the people around me, to being the good, amazing Greek wife, that for eight years, guys, I freaking hated it. For eight years, I completely dismissed the fact that I was profoundly unhappy. All because I was so worried about not pleasing people. I worried where the hell I would get all the accolades and pats on the back from. Where the hell would I get my self-esteem from? If I changed my identity of being a good Greek wife. But what I realized was after eight years of people pleasing, I realized that it wasn't going to change. Nothing was going to change unless I took the action. It was all on me to make the change, to stop people pleasing. So how the hell do you do this? Now, I am not saying go in there and say, screw you all, I don't care. I don't care if I make you happy or not, I'm gonna do me. No, 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 I'm not suggesting that because let's face it guys, things like that actually just become dismissive. And if you're trying to keep the wonderful relationship you have with the people that you were trying to please in the first place, because I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that you are pleasing them because you care about them. 
Okay, but that is a mis misconception, but let's just go down this path because at least that is how I got trapped. I really did want to please them, but it became my own trap. It became the velvet handcuffs that I put on myself and I chose to freaking throw, throw away the key. So now how do we unwind that? First step is acknowledging your actions. So actually, I would say right now is write down the thing that you are doing that doesn't align with the, what you want. So I'm going to use identity as a perfect example because that was where I was. So my identity was being the good Greek wife. I was doing that so that I could please people. Did it please people? Hell yes. What were the accolades I were getting? All the pats on the back of, being, of having this identity. Okay, great. Now I just have to acknowledge to the people close to me that actually this whole time, it hasn't made me happy. So what I did is I actually grabbed my husband and over time I realized I hate cooking for him. I hate cleaning for him. But that doesn't have any reflection of how I feel about him. So I sat him down. So take the person that you love, the person that you're trying to please, sit them down and just give them the grace that maybe they don't realize that your actions have actually been detrimental to your happiness. And so that's where I just started. I just said to my husband this whole time, I've been cooking and cleaning for you. Babe, I love you so much. Say your feelings. I love you so much. But for the last eight years, I have been cooking for you and cleaning for you and I've been utterly miserable. Now this is on me. Babe, I haven't vocalized the fact that this wasn't something that I wanted. I haven't told you how profoundly unhappy this has made me. But because I love you and because we have such an amazing relationship, I want to be really honest about where my actions have led me. And right now, in me trying to be the perfect wife and make you happy has led me to being profoundly unhappy. So I was just honest. I was transparent. I didn't say it was their fault, it was my actions. But I very much addressed that this was a problem. Okay, now the next step is I told my husband the actions I was going to change. Because when you go from being a people pleaser and you wanna change that into being the person that is proud of yourself, where you show up and please yourself first, that is going to cause maybe some friction because your actions are going to change. And so people are going to see your actions and they're going to push back. So for me, the best way in navigating, not being a people pleaser anymore, was being very transparent over my actions and how they were going to change. So I sat my husband down and I told him I was profoundly unhappy. I told him how I felt about him, that my actions had no, um, had no attachment to how I feel, felt about him. So I just told him with utter transparency and compassion and, um, you know, like he was my partner in crime and I was just telling him the truth about how I was feeling. And I said, honestly, babe, putting clothes out for you is like sucking my soul dry. This has nothing to do with you, but it's just me. It's not fulfilling anymore. And so I really don't want to put your clothes out. I really don't want to cook for you anymore. But how can I support you as we make this transition? That was the other, that, that's the last piece, guys, is giving this person that you're, you were people pleasing because you care about them. You're now making these changes in your relationship with them. But what are the things that you can do together so that they feel like you're not just saying, well, screw you now. I don't care about you and I don't want to please you anymore and I'm going to go do me. That isn't respectful, especially, especially when it's your partner or a parent or something like that. So I just brought my husband along with me on the journey. And so I said to him, right now there's going to be a transition phase where you're so used to me doing this all day, every day. And so as we start to change, as my actions start to change, I want to articulate them to you so that we can work through it together. So right now I cook and clean for you seven days a week. Next week, I'm gonna do it six days a week, babe. And then the week after that, I'm gonna do it five days a week. And then I'm gonna do it four days a week. How do you feel about that? And he just turned around and he said, of course, babe. If not having clean underwear or not having clean dishes is, is what it takes to make you happy, then of course, what kind of husband would I be if I put my clean underwear before your happiness? But that didn't mean that the transition was going to be easy. It meant that we had to come together, we had to talk about what that was gonna look like, and then we had to navigate the changes in my actions together. 
So guys, I went from being this person who was people pleasing and completely ignoring what I wanted and what was important to me, to then navigating it beautifully with the person that I was trying to people please and having them as my teammate and help me get out of the habitual pattern that I was in where I was neglecting myself. Ooh, I know that was a lot guys, but trust me, as you're navigating, going from being a people pleaser, letting go of this freaking habit that doesn't serve you, and transitioning into being the person you really want to be and creating healthy habits that does serve you. That, my friends, is exactly how you show up and change the narrative about you being a people pleaser, about you just being a nice scout and showing up and being the freaking badass where you are the hero of your own life. Ladies, 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 I know sometimes you worry that you're not good enough. Trust me, nobody knows that better than me. I spent almost a freaking decade having my soul sucked out of my body, doing something that I didn't love. Finally, even though I was scared to freaking death, I decided I was going to go for it. And I've ended up building the life of my dreams, a life I couldn't have imagined because I realized that radical confidence is being afraid and doing it anyway. I wrote this book for you with 10 no BS lessons that you need to go from feeling stuck and frustrated to doing anything that you set your mind to. Us nice girls often do what our parents want or what our family expects of us. How? of us have done that only to end up living a life where we're freaking miserable or we're living a life that we don't feel like is our own we're living our parents life we're living the thing their dream and then we realize maybe five years maybe 10 years maybe 15 maybe 20 years we realize oh my god we've been doing all of this just to do it for our parents. We've been doing all of this just to make our parents or our family happy. And actually, this isn't the life I want. I'm gonna give you a real world example, guys, of how I freaking navigated the expectation of my parents. So, number one, my dad, he didn't want me to study filmmaking. I wanted to be this filmmaker. I had these big lofty dreams that I was going to come to America and I was going to go and make movies and win an Academy Award. That was my narrative. That was the thing that I was, going to, I was saying when I was a kid over and over and over again. So when it came to me actually applying for my degree, my dad, very traditional Greek, who didn't see movie making as a way of actually making money. He had a very old school mentality that you had to study science, math, you had to become a lawyer or a doctor in order to be able to provide for yourself. Until, of course, you got married. Then you don't have to provide for yourself, then your partner can actually provide for you. That was the thinking. So when it comes to me wanting to be a movie maker, my dad just looked at me like I was not. He's like, no, it needs to be like journalism. There's actually, it's a credible profession. No, that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to make movies. But the pressure of having to do something that was perceived, perceived as being the right thing. I like joke. It's like, you know how like keeping up with the Joneses for the Greeks? It's like keeping up with the Jonesanopolises. That was how my family was. So if I wasn't doing anything that was quote unquote prestigious, like math or science or anything like that, it wasn't greeted with open arms. So guys, for two freaking weeks, I started arguing with my dad about what on earth I should study. And we were going back and forth and I was so heartbroken. And in the end, in the end, after two weeks of arguing, my dad actually ended up relinquishing and said, you know what, it's fine, study whatever you like. You're gonna be a stay at home wife anyway. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> now guys, before you go in horror about what my dad just said, my dad is a traditional Greek man. He was brought up with a certain beliefs. He comes from a tiny ass village in the mountains of freaking Cyprus where no woman ever got an education. My grandmother learned to, um, learned to read by actually teaching herself by reading the Bible. So just to give you a perspective of where my dad comes from. So his belief system of what he thought I should be doing echoed into what he was saying to me, which was, hey, you either study something super prestigious or doesn't really matter because you're gonna be a stay-at-home wife anyway. For two weeks, 
I was battling my dad's expectations. I was battling both sides of it. Because even when he said, we're well, going to be a stay at home wife anyway. That, that wasn't what I wanted. Even when he said that, I was like, oh my God, we went from one high expectation over here, not even high, but one expectation that I didn't want to fulfill of being, you know, into journalism or math or, you know, being a doctor or a lawyer to over here to the expectation that I was going to be a stay at home wife. Neither one sat well with me. So how on earth did I make sure I didn't get stuck? Because so many of us waste so many years studying something, biochemistry, whatever, only to realize as soon as we're done, we freaking hate it. And actually we want to be a stand up co comic. And the only reason why we said yes to that freaking degree was to make our parents happy. Sound familiar? So how I handled it was with utter grace that my dad and my mum have opinions too, that they have a certain belief system of where they come from. I didn't judge them for it, I just accept it. But accepting it really does allow you to take what they say with a pinch of salt. I'm gonna be honest, with a pinch of salt. Because I used to, without seeing it from my dad's perspective, I used to just take my dad and my mum's word for fact. How many of you do that? Or how many of you have done that? where well, you've taken someone that is you perceive to be wiser, more experienced than you, and you take it as fact. But what if instead of taking it as fact, you pivot that and you say, actually, this is just their perspective based on their belief system of where they come from. Now, if you can put your perspective into that, maybe now, at least it did for me, it allowed me to take their opinion and not just put it upon myself as I meant to be. I took their opinion as just that, their opinion. And once I was able to see it like that and divorce my emotion with wanting my, to please my parents, the emotion of wanting to do what my parents expected of me. Once I was able to divorce my emotions from that, I could actually just ask myself, does this feel right to me? And when I came up with the answer, which was no, then I could just have that honest conversation with them with respect and say, I hear you, I understand why you want me to do it, but it is my life, I love you, but it is my life. Now look, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to respond with grace. It doesn't mean they're going to be like, oh, okay, great, it's your life, do what you want. No, no, I'm not saying that. I just mean that when you're doing any of this, how on earth do you keep showing up with authenticity? How do you keep showing up to stop being that nice girl that everyone expects and be the freaking badass that wants to live her life for her? This is how is that you give the grace, you give the honesty, you give the openness that you've heard them and that you understand them. But with grace, that isn't the path you're going to take. And that is exactly what I did. That is exactly what I did when my dad told me that he didn't want me to marry my husband. When Tom went and proposed, my dad, who's Greek Orthodox, saw Tom, who was not Greek Orthodox, his belief system said, I've never seen a Greek Orthodox and a non-Greek Orthodox work out. So, of course, your, your relationship's gonna be disaster. That's where he went straight to. Now, the truth was, that was his perspective. I understood that, I saw that, I gave the, him the grace that that was going to be his perspective, but then I asked myself, whose life are you living, Lisa? Are you living your life for your dad? Because if you are, you shouldn't marry Tom because he's just told you not to. But if you're living your life, if you know as heartbreaking as it is, guys, if nature takes this course correctly, my dad passes away before me. Fuck, I get that, that's hard to say out loud, but it's the fucking truth. I'm just gonna say it, it's the goddamn bloody truth. If nature is accurate and takes its natural path, your parents will absolutely pass before you. So don't wait to then start realizing this is your life. Start living it now because it is just that. It is your freaking life. And don't let anyone else's expectations dictate how you show up. As cliche as it freaking is, when I was a kid, there was a guy who patted my sister on the head and said, little girls should only speak when spoken to. 
I'm sorry? I'm sorry? That's what we're freaking taught as little girls to only speak when spoken to? No wonder, guys, we are here as adults wondering how the hell we keep showing up to do things for other people and we keep letting people walk all over us. No wonder, because we're told subliminally over and over and over again that as women, we should never rustle any feathers. That as women, we should never go against the grain. We're taught that. But now here's the thing, I don't beat myself up for the things that we're taught. I just go, does it serve us right now? And if the answer is no, then freaking we need to stop it. So guys, I'm gonna ask you, right now, does letting people walk over you serve you or not? If you can say not, now you've just made the decision. Okay, this doesn't serve me. That's the first key, is making sure you don't let people's opinions dictate how you show up. So great, you've now established, no, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't serve me. So I am next time going to stand up for myself. All right, you've made the declaration. Now, how the hell do you actually do it? So my first tactic when I started on this path of trying not to let people walk all over me was to be aggressive. And so I really did find it very difficult. And so I went in like freaking Tony Soprano, like I'm gonna make sure you don't step all over me. And I just became aggressive. Now let's face it, when someone comes, comes at you with pure aggression, what do you do? You put up your walls, you resist. So no wonder, as I was trying to, um, to create this new habit, no wonder people were resisting. So I realized, okay, that isn't the, the best strategy. So here's a real story from my own evolution of trying to actually stop letting people walk all over me. That I'm just gonna carry up by saying, guys, I was the one that created this problem. This isn't like, oh my God, other people are coming at you. No, 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 I created the problem myself. So it was early days of Quest and I was a nurturer. I had been the stay-at-home wife for eight years, so I was very naturally um, inclined to, someone walks in the room, oh, can I get you tea? Can I get you a cup of coffee? How can I get you, you know, like, what can I do for you? And so as Quest was growing more and more and I started stepping into being a businesswoman, this like offer of me just like, how can I help? Like, what can I do? I just, I didn't let go of. And so what ended up happening was I would find myself in these big business meetings where there would be multiple businessmen, especially, but also women, and I would walk in there and I'd be like, oh, a cup of tea, cup of coffee. Does anyone want anything? You're hungry, you want a snack? I was creating the problem. I was the one that, I, that did it. And then what ended up happening? What a shock, what a shock that a year into it, all of a sudden I will walk into a business meeting and everyone turned to me and gave me their coffee order. What a shock. Now here's the thing guys, I can't freaking blame anyone. It was all my doing. I set myself up for disaster. I set myself up to let people know that this is what I would accept. To tell people, yeah, I'm the coffee person, I'm the tea person. Now look, there may be nothing wrong with that. The only time it becomes something wrong was, is when that you're, you're trying to actually exude a different persona. So over time, over the year of growing the company, where now I started to change my identity, I started to walk in with more confidence, I started to walk in as a businesswoman. And yet, walking in as a businesswoman, where there's a table of a bunch of entrepreneurs, and then all of a sudden people are turning up to me for coffee. I started to get frustrated, I started to get annoyed. And originally I was starting to be like, I can't believe people are treating me like this. I can't believe that I've, built, I've helped build this company into what it is and I still walk into a room as the freaking lead of the department and people still ask me for coffee. I was like, I got really annoyed until I realized it was all my fault. It was all my own doing. So I said, okay, Lisa, this is the most beautiful thing. You've realized that you are the creator of this, which actually means that you can undo it. Now, how do you do that? Again, going back to, so that I'm just not walking into the room like freaking Tony Soprano, because now imagine I walk into the room and everyone's like, or people are like, Lisa, can, I, can, can you get a coffee? And I'm like, no, I'm not getting you a coffee. That would, how would that be perceived on their end? I'm like, what the hell, man? What's wrong with Lisa? One minute, she's offering freaking tea. And then the next thing you know, I just ask for a tea and she she's like getting offended by it. Rightly so, they would be confused because I've made the change in my head, but I haven't vocalized the change. I haven't shown up and shown that I have changed. So that's the key, guys. That's where you need to start from. You need to acknowledge within yourself where you're doing the people pleasing, 
You need to then acknowledge what the act is that you do that doesn't align with you now. You then need to take that act and express to the people around you why you're no longer going to be doing it. You can say it with calmness. You can actually say it with incredible inspiration. You can be like, I didn't even realize, guys, that all this time I was coming in offering you guys tea. This whole time, I've realized that in doing that, I can actually take that time and I can actually go and learn this. So from now on, I'm not going to be making tea because for the 15 minutes that I was making tea and coffee for everybody, I realized I wasn't actually getting towards my goal. I realized that I wasn't actually building the skill sets that I need to walk towards the thing that I want in life. Whatever, whatever the words you need to use are. But you understand that the vocalization of the changes in your acts is the way that I went from being this freaking person that was just people pleasing, that recognized this didn't serve me, to then changing my actions and being the person you see now, who doesn't get asked to make a coffee when I walk in the room. But you better freaking believe I still allow myself the grace that on those times that I still want to take care of people, I can walk in and still ask them if they want a tea and coffee, but I don't feel obligated to do it and I don't feel compelled and the pressure to do it in the worry that maybe someone won't like me if I don't. So that guys is how you go from having habits and routines of being a people pleaser, from always showing up over and over again to just letting people dictate what you should do for them to then taking ownership, setting the guidelines, and then telling people that when they come to you asking you to make them a cup of tea, you now have the ability to say no with utter grace. Set boundaries. Read yourself your freaking boundary rights because you have every right to have them. You have the right to say no without feeling badly. You have the right not to meet someone else's unreasonable freaking expectations. You have the right to make your needs just as important as those of others. You have the right to set your own priorities and you have the right to act on those priorities. You have the right to renegotiate your boundaries at any freaking time. And you also have the right to an attorney, but homie, I really hope it doesn't come to that. All right, now that you've read yourself your boundary right, hopefully now you really freaking believe in the importance of them. Now we're going to actually go down the types of boundaries because this is going to be one of those moments that you need to assess which boundary it is that you need to place. So now let's actually address the type of boundary that you're going to probably consider doing. So number one is your material boundaries. This is a boundary that you set in regards to your possessions. So for instance, if your friend comes and she hasn't got a good reputation of borrowing things and then returning them, she comes and asks you if she can borrow something again. So maybe you have to set a boundary where you say, you can, but you have to actually get the dress washed before you return it and I need it back by Tuesday because I'm going to a work gig on Wednesday, whatever. So what you've done is you've actually said yes, but you've created boundaries so that you can actually be comfortable in saying yes in the first place. All right, the next thing is physical boundaries. Now, this obviously is very tricky, but for me, even when it came to my relationship with my husband, I just made a non-negotiable physical boundary. And so I just said to my husband, babe, for clarity, this is a physical boundary of mine. You can never lay a physical hand on me in an abusive way. Now, you may say, well, of course, that should we even need to say that, Lisa? That is up to you. But to me, that was something that was very imperative that I told my partner and I literally let him know there's no wiggle room. This isn't a negotiable boundary. This isn't a boundary that maybe you cross sometimes accidentally, because we all know that some people accidentally do that. Or this isn't a boundary that you, we can like, oh, it's kind of wishy-washy, maybe sometimes it's gonna be here, maybe it's not, no, no, no. I made it really freaking clear. This boundary is like cemented in concrete and if you cross it, I'm out the door. And so I just made it very clear that he knew that going into the relationship. 20 years later, he's never once crossed that boundary. But it was imperative for me to set that up from the get-go. 
All right, now mental and emotional boundaries. Guys, these are the mama jammers. These are the really freaking hard boundaries to set because why? They're emotional. People are going to probably push back when it comes to an emotional boundary. They may try to persuade you. They may try and convince you that the emotion you're feeling isn't quote unquote right or that you shouldn't quote unquote have that boundary. And this is where people are going to try and convince you. But the great news is, with everything that I'm saying, you're going to take time on your own before you set this boundary and really ground yourself in it. Ground yourself in the mental and emotional boundary that you need to set and then express why. So here's a perfect example that I'm going to give that happened with my mum. Now, when I talk about boundaries, I'm just going to caveat by saying everything I say here is assuming that you want to have a beautiful relationship with this person. If it's a boundary that you, where someone is just being disrespectful, being abusive, I am not giving advice on that. That to me becomes a, you cut your ties, I literally will just push that person out of my life because nobody gets to cross that abusive line. So I just want to make that really clear. So now, imagine someone is crossing your emotional boundary, but it's someone that you love, someone you really care about, someone you really want to have a relationship with. How the hell do you do it? So. I'm gonna give you a real world example that happened to me. I was suffering, I still suffer from immense gastric issues. My gut is always in disarray. And so at the beginning, when it was first happening, I tried every ounce of my being to stay mentally strong. And so what I had to do is I had to trick myself into not thinking that I was sick. I had to make sure that I had distractions because I noticed that every time I started to think about how sick I was, it actually had a knock-on effect where my health became more and more detrimental. So I knew I have to keep my mental space clear. I have to keep my mental and emotional space strong. But here I was, every time I would speak to my mum, the first thing out of her mouth every time we would speak on the phone, the very first words were, Hi, how are you? How's your gut? Are you okay? Now look, as a mother, that's very sweet. Obviously, she wants to see how I am. But when I'm desperately trying every single freaking day to show up with just enough strength to get through the day, just someone reminding me of how sick I was, just somebody asking me with a pity tone, to me was just too much. It was just too crippling. And so originally I just tried to ignore it. I tried to like shut my mom down. I tried to sometimes ignore her calls because right now I was actually feeling in moments where I was feeling vulnerable. I was like, okay, just don't take her call just in case she penetrates and you break. But what I realized was that wasn't actually the right way to handle it. And when I say right way, I mean that wasn't having my relationship, it wasn't building my relationship with my mom. If anything, it was actually making it more, de it was actually splitting us up. I was less inclined to call her. I was less excited to speak to her. But I knew that I had to set some boundaries here in order for me to keep showing up, in order for me to keep wanting to build this relationship with my mom. But how the hell do you set boundaries with somebody that you love so much and that is only doing something because she cares about you? Woo! That was tough. And so I just went in there. Step one is I explained my situation. My mum didn't realise what she was having the knock-on effect. That was on me. I had to vocalise that to her. And so I had to sit her down and take a moment and just say, Mum, I know how much you love me. Because that's the thing, you don't want to go at someone because they think that you're saying that their intentions aren't great. And the second that someone is feeling like you're saying their intentions aren't great, they're going to get defensive again. And so I had to let my mum know, mum, I understand your intentions, your intentions. You want, as my mother, you care about me. And so mum, I totally get that. So expressing their intention, you really, you know what their intention are. But then on the other hand, saying how it is impacting you. And so I just said to my mum, right now, every time we get on the phone and you ask me, how are you? In the pity tone, with the sadness, it is becoming very difficult for me to stay strong. And right now, mum, I need to be around people and I need your support to be strong. So I've used the word support. So I am turning to her. I'm not trying to shut her down. I'm actually engaging her more. I'm telling her the problem I'm trying to overcome. 
I'm also, sometimes, to be honest, guys, I just admit that maybe I'm just thinking, like, maybe this is an, um, a skill set right now that I don't have. I wish I could be better. I actually wish I could get on the phone right now and you say in that tone and that I was strong enough to actually face this too. I really do wish that I was strong enough, but right now I'm not. And so while I'm trying to get strong, I would love it if you could help me and then you express what helping you actually looks like. So, I've just laid out, very nuanced, guys. This is super freaking important. I don't just like to give blanket freaking statements. The nuance of how you work through this, the nuance of how you handle these situations are absolutely, are absolutely going to dictate how you show up in your relationship with that person. And I really wanted a wonderful, healthy relationship with my mom. And so bringing her in was my first step. Now here's the thing. I honestly thought I got this shit down, that worked perfectly, I had this conversation, I went in with a strategy, everything I just told you guys, oh my god, my mum says she understood, like literally she's like, okay darling, I hear you, I understand, yes, I was like, nailed it, like I'm so fucking good at this, pat on the back, phone rings and the next day, I pick it up, hey mum, hey sweetheart, how are you? Am I in a freaking twilight zone? We literally, we literally just had a whole conversation about my mental and emotional boundary, why I was setting it. I felt like I was articulate. I felt like I was calm. She said she understood. And then the next really freaking day, she calls me up and says the same thing. So in that moment, guys, I'm just going to be honest. I wasn't cool, calm and collective. I wasn't the person that I really wished I was. In that moment, I just lost it. And I was like, Mom, come on. You're really, like, it's really damaging. And I just, like, let out all the emotions. And then, of course, what did that do? That just made us come head to head again. So I had to collect myself. I was like, okay, coming at my mum like this isn't going to be great. Collect yourself. And now I was like, Mom, please, I'm grasping a freaking straws. Where was the, did you understand what I was trying to communicate? So going back to the conversation, see if maybe there was a miscommunication there, that maybe you actually left the, the, the discussion on different pages and you didn't realize it. So that's where I started. Mum, did you understand what I said yesterday? She said, yes, darling. Okay. Did you understand what I was trying to get to? She said, yes, darling. So I was like, okay, mum, where's the disconnect? Right? If you can just take them through it, ask the questions and try and do it without judgment. Or like putting like, where's the disconnect? Just be like, okay, mom, great, I didn't understand. Okay, can you just explain to me where the disconnect is? Because I really thought that we were on the same page. And then she just turned around to me and matter of factly, she's like, I just wanna ask my daughter how she's feeling. And so now we started at square one. So now I was like, okay, this boundary that I've said hasn't actually computed. So now let's go back. Let's actually keep talking about it because that's the whole point, guys. You're never gonna freaking get it right the first time. It's never going to be perfect. But with boundaries, the important thing is, is that you keep showing up for them. Is that you keep rinsing and repeating. You refine and you rinse and you repeat. And you, especially when it's someone that you really want to communicate with. You want to be together on that boundary. So I went back to square one. I asked my mum where the miscommunication was. And in that discussion, the heavens opened up. And I realised the angels were singing. And I realized that my mom actually had some boundaries herself that I was crossing. And she finally told me, by not asking me how I felt, meant that she wasn't a good enough mother. And I had asked her to not ask me, which to her was me crossing her motherly unspoken boundary. Take that in for a second. My boundary, I had zero idea, was crossing her emotional boundary because I had asked her to not ask me how I was. And so I was like, oh my God, mom, are you actually trying to tell me that me telling you to not ask me has crossed your boundary and now you feel like I have dis, um, disrespected you as a mother? Not disrespected, but crossed that line. And she finally admitted yes. And I said, all right, mom, this is the most beautiful thing. 
Because when it comes to setting boundaries, when it comes to not just saying yes to everyone, to trying to please everybody, now it comes into play where you've been totally transparent, the person on the other side has been totally transparent, and now you can still show up and navigate these boundaries together and come up with a beautiful way of having a solution where you're both respecting each other's boundaries. And so in this perfect example that I've just laid out right here, right now, me and my mum's beautiful middle ground of where we both set our boundaries and we felt good about them was the fact that I asked her, please don't say it first thing, like the very first word out of your mouth, I wanna be, I wanna hear you be cheerful, I wanna hear you happy. And then her boundary was that she still has to ask. So I said, great, what if you asked me halfway through the conversation and it's not the first thing? That way I hear your spirit, I hear the happiness. And then the last piece was I just said, mum, if you can just approach it in a positive way instead of a heartbroken, sad way, because tone to me is everything. And once we had that open, incredible, beautiful conversation, we both found this amazing middle ground where we respected each other's boundaries and we came together and now there is zero conflict in mine and my mum's telephone conversations. All right, ladies, we need to stop apologising. And yet, in the same tone, we need to always apologise. Now, okay, okay, before you start screaming at me, go, Lisa, you freaking nuts, what are you talking about? Let me break it down for you. If you forget your homie's birthday, you should bloody call him and apologize. If you told someone you're gonna do something and you completely forgot or you fell through or you went to do it and completely messed up, to me, it's totally fine. And going, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I messed up there. I think owning and admitting when you truly are sorry is so beautiful. And at the same time, people, we need to stop freaking apologizing for all the crap that isn't our fault. All the stuff where people expect you to start apologizing. That's when the words start coming out. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Even to the silliest moment where a stranger walks by you, they bump you, and you turn around and you're like, I'm sorry. What the hell? Why? Because we want to be nice, right? We're just like, it's the right thing to do, Lisa. It's just the things that come out when we were taught when we were young to just say, I'm sorry. I get it. I get it. This isn't about beating ourselves up over the fact that we are doing that. It's about recognizing it, saying that doesn't serve me, and then pivoting to make sure that we don't keep doing it. Now, why, you may be wondering, why are you saying I'm sorry bad in the first place? Like, well, really, Lisa, what does it matter if I just say I'm sorry all the time? It couldn't hurt, right? It couldn't hurt. Mm-hmm. That's where I am here to say it actually could hurt. Let me just take an example of how powerful words can be. I'll tell you a little story. I was on vacation, standing in line at a buffet, and this woman behind me starts going, oh, how are you? First time here, what do you think of the hotel, blah, blah, blah. So we start chatting and she asks me what I do. So I start telling her about Quest Nutrition, Impact Theory, my show Women of Impact. And then all of a sudden I realize, okay, Lisa, you're talking a lot. You should actually ask her a question. So I was like, oh, what do you do? She turns around and she's like, I'm just a mother. I'm just a mother. Guys, she used the word just. In referring to herself, who had three children that she was homeschooling and she said just what do you think that's doing to her self-esteem what do you think by using that word just it's telling her the story in her head that what she's bringing to the table isn't valuable that it's like eh, it's no big deal that story just by using the word just absolutely dictated the way she was talking to me she kind of just shrugged and was like eh, it's not a big deal and I couldn't help myself, but I was like, I'm sorry, homie, but like, oh my God, are you joking? That's such a freaking huge deal. You're, you're literally helping the next generation of people. You're literally helping bring them up. That's amazing. Like, and I, I just called her and I was like, you really shouldn't use the word just. Now, by the time we got to the front of the line, guys, you should have seen the change in her demeanor. Just by removing the word just, she went from not feeling worthy of herself 
to feeling like a freaking badass that actually was impacting the next generation of humans. So that gives context to why it can be super freaking dangerous to your self-esteem, people, to your self-esteem, by saying sorry to the things that aren't your fault. I'm just going to repeat that. It can be detrimental to who you are by saying sorry to the things that aren't your fault or even to the things that you have right, a right to freaking choose. So for instance, it's Friday night. You've been going ham all week at work. You're freaking exhausted. You're shattered. You've been bloody working so hard and you can't wait. You just can't wait to put on your PJs, grab your glass of wine or your joint, whichever one you want, and just freaking veg on the sofa, watch Sex in the City reruns with a tub of ice cream. And then your friend hits you up. Hey, we're all going for dinner. Oh my God, it would be amazing. We really want you to come. Can you come? Because it would really mean a lot to me. Let's just throw in some pressure of the emotion as well. Now, sometimes your instinct, A, may be to just say yes, but we actually address that with saying no. Then your other instinct may be to say, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I can't come. And let's just stop here for a second. Your friends invited you out. They want you to come. And yet for you, you're so burnt out emotionally, physically, that the only thing that actually feels good for you right now is to reboot by sitting your ass on that freaking sofa and vegging out. But you're saying you're sorry. Now, maybe you don't want to let them down. Okay, cool. That's very understandable. But when you say you're sorry for choosing self-care ahead of anything else, what do you think that subliminal message is saying to you? Remember, take that woman that said the word just. The subliminal message that you're giving yourself time and time and time again when you are saying you're sorry for putting yourself first. It is telling you, you are telling yourself that you are not worthy of taking care of yourself. You are telling yourself that it is a bad thing. It is actually a bad thing that you have chosen to put yourself first. So guys, sometimes you just got to ditch the word sorry. Sometimes you absolutely can still say no. So sometimes you just got to ditch the phrase, I'm sorry. And if they are close friends of yours in this situation, then you'd like to think they actually care about your self-care. And so here are a couple of examples, guys. In real time, I want you to actually write down, get out your pen and paper right now, and I want you to write these things down right now so that when an occasion comes, you could go to your cheat sheet and you can look, and instead of saying sorry, you're going to say the equivalent. All right, are you ready? Let's do this. So instead of saying, I'm so sorry I can't come, say, I'm not available, but thanks for the invite. I know it's going to be a blast. Instead of saying, I'm so sorry, could you do me a favor? Say, I'd really appreciate your help with this. Instead of saying, I'm sorry I bothered you, say, thanks for listening. Instead of saying, I'm so sorry I don't understand, say, could you explain that last part again? And one that I struggled with a lot was, I'm so sorry, but this isn't what I ordered. And now I say, excuse me, I ordered steak and this is a bowl of lettuce. So. Guys, those are real examples of how you take phrases. You are still saying the same sentiment, but you're eliminating the word sorry. You are eliminating that subliminal message that you're giving yourself that what you have decided to do or what you need is wrong. By eliminating the five letter word sorry has allowed you to eliminate that negative subliminal messaging. There it is, my homies. That is how you freaking show up to be an utter badass. Let go of those nice girl habits that are not serving you and show up to be your full freaking incredible, unstoppable self. Tap that subscribe button, press the like, comment in the sections, guys, which one freaking was fire and hit you the most. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace. You end up seeing people around you and the girls around you and the type of people that uh, end up being liked or disliked. And you realise that actually it ends up being a lot to do with your physical form. Mm. And so, you noticed that even at that oh, age. Oh yeah, because I was, I was like either bullied about...